Well, hello, everybody. It is so uh, lovely to virtually see you. Hopefully, we'll at least see some video from a bunch of you all. Um, and uh, hopefully, next year, we'll be able to try this in person. Um, so as you probably know, I'm Langdon White. I have uh, was one of the founders of uh, DevConf US. And uh, we uh, kind of modeled this conference off of DevConf CZ. Um, but I would also like to welcome my co-chairs for this year and last year, in fact, uh, Sally O'Malley, uh, Sally Can Wave, um, and uh, Urvashi uh, Mahani. No, did I say it right? Mah nope, I always say it wrong. Um, so uh, one thing I wanted to say is, uh, as many of you know, I kind of uh, transitioned uh, what I was doing over the past month uh, to uh, kind of a new job over at Boston University. And I wanted to give a huge shout out to uh, Sally and Avashi for really picking it up uh, and taking the conference through and making it happen. Uh, I really, it, it's, there's a time when you drop the ball uh, and then there's a time when you don't realize that you even drop the ball and it just got fixed for you in the background. And that's what happened here. And I wanted to express my huge gratitude to how nice a job they've done. Uh, so now uh, I would like to introduce, um, I'm not sure who's going first, so I'm going to start with Urvashi, uh, and because uh, I think Sally might be doing the next slide. So, Awesome. That was right, Langdon. I'm going next. And thank you for the amazing introduction. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fourth annual DEF Month US. For the first time attendees, we are super excited to have you here. And for returning attendees, can you believe it has already been a year since the last DEF Con? Where did all the time go? We're really glad that you all could join us today. First of all, we would like to thank our track captains for volunteering their time to curate all the awesome content you'll be seeing throughout the conference today. We would also like to thank um, our, the, DEF Con, the DEF Con crew, everyone from event planning to session moderators to social media managers. This wouldn't have been possible without you. So a big shout out and thanks to all of you. And now on to Sally. <laughs> I want to uh, definitely say that again, a big shout out to our volunteers. They were amazing this year and a big shout out to Urvashi because she is the one that kept the conference going. <laughs> so um, some logistics, you can check out the reception page. Uh, it has all of the information that you'll need to navigate the conference. Um, if you have questions, head to the help desk which is under the expo tab and there will always be somebody there to answer any questions you'll find all of the sessions under the tracks tab each track or theme of the conference is a continuous room sort of it's a it's a it feels like a room because the talks are continuous throughout the day so if you go to sked the schedule and find what time the talk you're interested in, then just join the track at that time. The previous talk may be finishing up. There may be a lull in between talks. Feel free to chat. Um, and also during the talks, feel, please ask questions to the speakers, use the session chat. Um, if you are asking questions, you should use the Q&A tab in the session chat. Um, the moderators will be watching that. Um, if you if you use the this the chat the session chat, it's okay. We'll find it, but try to use the Q and A tab. It'll be easier. Um, I don't think I forgot anything, but if I did, or she'll let you know. <laughs> no, you didn't. That's great. And just to let everyone know, your um, the sessions and the tracks will show up five to 10 minutes before the scheduled time. So right, that's why right now you're not seeing anything under the tracks tab. They will show up at 10.20 AM for the 10.30 AM um, tracks. All right, um, so we know you all miss Boston and we'd like to bring a piece of Boston to you. So we have created a video tour showing the amazing and beautiful places that Boston has to offer. Um, we hope you will get a feel of Boston via this virtual tour. So join us back on the stage at 3 p.m. Eastern today to travel around Boston with us. I want to interject there that this was an amazing idea that uh, basically the video tour is being done by participants in the conference. Uh, so it is not like a professional tour. Uh, and so you should really get some weird insights into Boston. I know the parts I submitted were definitely some weird little clips. Uh, so it is definitely worth checking out. 
Yep, thanks Langdon. Um, and we all need to keep our tummies happy, so we have arranged for some delicious food and drinks. To get access, take a few steps to your kitchen and join us for a virtual cooking class with a professional chef on Friday morning at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. We'll be making mocktails, bagels, and a frittata. So check out the schedule to grab the ingredients beforehand and let's get cooking. Um, want to win some DEF CON goodies? Uh, so join, join us for the closing and trivia session on Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. We will be testing your DEF CON knowledge. So make sure you participate in all the events and attend as many sessions as you can for a chance to win. Great, and we have two contests running throughout the conference. The first one is called Shake It Till You Make It. Tweet a picture of a drink that keeps you going and tag us. Uh, you'll find the instructions and the details at the, um, in the expo, in the help desk, sorry. And uh, the other contest is Red Hot Chili Preppers. That, you'll tweet a, a picture of the results of the virtual cooking class and winners will be chosen and announced on Friday at the closing ceremony. This is a lot of information to take in, but just like any conference, just it's just like any conference, but virtual, just enjoy and engage and participate. And we hope you really have fun here at DEF CONF US. Oh, one more thing um, that we, we try really hard to make DEF CONF an inclusive conference. And there are a lot of first time speakers and that is awesome. So keep that in mind when you're giving feedback and uh, just maintain a very friendly crowd like we always do. All right. Sorry, and uh, so as we usually do at the DevConf uh, events is we announce uh, kind of the next DevConf. So the next DevConf will be CZ, uh, which is, I think will be its 14th, maybe it's 15th. I don't know, a ridiculously large number. Uh, and uh, the proposal to the CFP is open uh, probably right this minute. Um, if not, but it'll be done before the weekend. Uh, so you should go check it out and go submit a talk there if you didn't get your talk selected for this one. Um, I know they are attempting to do something in person, um, but we'll see how that goes. Everyone knows the uh, situation the whole world is in. Uh, so, you know, hopefully uh, we'll all be able to go. Um, but if not, at least we'll be able to have a virtual conference and we can at least chat with each other. But again, um, I wanted to reiterate what Sally was saying is that uh, it is incredibly important that uh, you uh, support the speakers at this conference. Uh, this is a conference that is meant to be a place to be training ground. Um, you know, we obviously have some very accomplished speakers as well, as you'll see in a few minutes, um, but we also have new speakers and and we really want them to be able to grow and learn as speakers uh, without having to worry about, uh, you know, being criticized for, you know, not being perfect. So make sure you submit your proposals. Uh, don't forget to submit your proposals for India, which will be after that. Uh, and, you know, obviously DevConf US in the fall of next year. Hopefully and in person. Yeah. One more note that I, I forgot there. I wanted to point out there are different chats. So when you're in a session, uh, up at the top right, you'll see the session chat tab. That only people in that session can see the chat. It's very easy to, easy to toggle over to the event chat. And that's, uh, in general, everybody in the conference can see that. So I will make that mistake probably 50 times. Um, but I'm warning you. Yep. And um, if you're having any issues or questions or just want to say hi to us, feel free to ping us in the event chat or at the help desk under the expo booth. Um, three of us will be floating around the conference throughout both the days. And we hope you have an awesome conference. All right. So now it is time for our keynote. Drum roll. <laughs> we all love open source, and I'm sure many of us love games too. I'm super excited to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Royal O'Brien has served um, as a US Marine and as a business and engineering veteran with more than 30 years of experience in the corporate enterprise and video game industry. Much of his time nowadays is spent working with partners and the community to create business and open source practices for the open 3D initiatives in the Linux Foundation. He previously served at Amazon as the game chief, 
Game Team Chief Evangelist, working directly with senior leaders at AWS to create the overall vision and strategy to define the O3DE open source project. Um, plan, license, and timeline and features. Today, we have Royal talking to us about building the O3D open source community. Welcome, Royal, and please take it away. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, we're going to put a deck on this. This is, uh, I can tell everybody, this is going to be like a fire hydrant. There's a lot of information because starting up an open source project is not an easy feat. All right, hopefully everybody can see it. So uh, today we're gonna talk about really, not just open source of putting something out there, but how to actually grow and sustain an ecosystem around it and to get it moving. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of, where do we begin? So if you think about it, you first have to start somewhere of an idea. And it really starts with that idea to question, you know, why would you do this? And we took a look at the landscape and it was like, well, there's a huge divide between the big tech world and the gaming world. And the funny thing is you'll find it, big tech and startups, they have a lot of uh, you know, open source use. You'll find that they're really, uh, they, they really enjoy using open source. They understand how to do contribute back into it. They understand the quality, security, and the interoperability uh, of using those projects. But when we start going into games, you'll find out they don't share a lot. Um, and it's kind of generally licensed and you don't get much access to what's being built. And so it came down to this. We need more open source in gaming. Um, this was the basis idea that started of why going down this road and expanded from there. And so you have to look at the landscape. You know, what does it look like? Well, there are AAA engines that are out there and they are proprietary. Um, but the thing is the source, 100% of it's not always available and there are strings attached. Um, and then there are other things such as if they're breaking changes that they do to the engine, uh, it can leave some projects orphaned uh, or can be problematic. And for, in some cases, when people want to build different innovations, they'll wait until the engine implements or can support that innovation, which can kind of lag behind because you're following that company's uh, initiative of what they're doing. And then if we look at the AA and limited purposes engines that are out there uh, in open source, uh, they're out there and you know they're pretty good, but they don't really have the kind of high fidelity that people are trying to get to to build and commercialize like a AAA game or a high fidelity simulation. And in some cases, they just lack modern features. And when we talk about that, I'm not talking about the small projects that have these great things. It's the collective solution of it all together. So, you know, if you look at a 3D engine, though, it really is as complex as an operating system. I mean, what does it take if I want to build one from scratch? You're talking about eight years at least to get to feature parity. And then you have an ongoing commitment. You've got to keep pace with the advancements, which are continuously moving. And then you have a huge amount of investment just funding teams, technology. And then the other part is you have to have that specialized knowledge. You're talking about science, math, engineering, and you need developers who have years of experience in the graphics, hardware, physics, lighting, engineering, excuse me, lighting, networking, cloud services, and things like that. And the integration experience, you know, you've got to look at that expertise for binding all of these things together. How do I get my network stack, my core, my game loop, my simulation, you know, physics? How do I get all these things to work together and then let it be diverse on different kinds of hardware and software platforms and OSs? Um, so it's a pretty nasty web and it's very complex. So to start out, you've got to have a vision with a mission. And so the vision and the mission we have here is that the mission of O3D is to make an open source, fully featured, high fidelity, real time 3D engine for building games and simulation available to every industry. If you notice, we kind of grew outside of just that games. We realized that a lot of other places are using the same technologies that are found in game engines. So now you just need some values. And I mean, ones that people can actually really get behind. And so if you think about it, we had to first start out, what are the things, the core pieces of this? Well, it's gotta be neutral. And I don't mean just neutral, like, you know, a couple of companies throwing it around. I mean, to all technologies and all companies, you know, it's gotta be something where the interfaces aren't just tied to, hey, I'm making an interface for Windows. It's how do I make an interface that's gonna work with Mac, Linux, Windows, Android, everything, and remove any of the encumbrances uh, possible so that any company can get involved and you're not tying yourself to one company. It needs to be agnostic to the industry. That means even though the core is based in a game dev engine, it should be able, you should be able to bring other industries who want to use these things. If car companies want to build dashboards out of 3D engines and things like that, they should be able to strip it down and use it for what they want. And it needs to be open, transparent, and accessible. That means that no matter what somebody's agenda or interests are, it has to be open to the community to actually make those decisions in a distributed manner. And it accepts the contributions from everybody based on the merit of what they're actually going to do. And that's gotta be, you know, and you follow that to these values. 
it's got to be easy to adopt. That means as things change, you've got to be able to onboard, change the documentation, the materials, so they're up to date and people can explore how they can use it. If they can't figure it out, they're not going to touch it. It needs to be fair. That means any kind of undue influence, bad behavior, or pay to play. You don't want where you have companies sponsoring this and then dragging it where it's a, where it's a company's initiative. It needs to stay open with a level playing field. And then the other part is it's got to be modular. This is really important because the problem is if you don't make it modular, people have to start kind of shimming it into places into the core, and it just creates a lot of breaking changes and collisions and things like that. So making sure it's done modular so people can take out what they want and use it, that's really essential. And it has to be platform agnostic, which means it can't just be built for Windows. It's got to be built for Mac or Linux or any of these other platforms and the architecture and operating systems because they can use it anywhere. So to whom and why is this important? Well, why is it important to developers? Because that means they can spend more time building their game and simulation and not maintaining the engine. They get a big head start because they have everything they need in one inclusive package that they can build upon. And they become a part of a community because it's a, uh, there are a lot of high quality experts in many diverse areas that are both private and corporate that are contributing to this. And it's free to use. You have the flexible open source uh, uh, Apache 2.0 licensing, licensing so that they can actually create their intellectual property and carry it with them. So why is it important to companies then? Well, because they can support and sustain projects so developers can actually depend on this. And that means that they can drive and influence the future direction of the project. If they build something to support it, we all use our web browser today, but you don't build your pages in your web browser. You use Photoshop or things like that. These are the support projects that go behind one that create this kind of ecosystem. And they can accelerate the needs by taking on kind of a formal role. If they see an opportunity, they can get involved and do something with it. And it allows them to kind of better align their downstream projects with some of the upstream community. And the other part is when, when companies start trying to look for help or resources in an area, it can be tough to find. You'll find it in some of their game engines. Uh, a lot of the really good engineers are hard to find. But in an open source community, you can go to GitHub and take a look at where they're making commits or go into like Discord or where people are talking to find the talent. And then the security, of course, by transparency, because you have a lot of contributors, it's not in a box where somebody finds that hole, which means you get higher reliability, lower maintenance, and sustainment costs. So how does it get consumed? So the license to the users is Apache 2, but there's an option to actually license it under MIT for uh, different groups that need GPLv2 compatibility. But the contributions are licensed under both Apache 2 and MIT. Um, it's the requirement that we have to ensure that it can be used by almost anyone. But the contributors can retain ownership of their IP and license it. That's the thing. They can make a fork and carry it if they wish. There's no CLA so that's separate. We actually have a DCO that simply says that, yes, I can contribute this, and this is what I'm uh, able to do, and you agree to it. And the use of the name and logo for the related projects and services, just you follow the trademark policy. And the open source versions that we support out of the gate are PC, Mac, Linux, iOS, and Android. But it doesn't mean that we don't support the rest because you can actually do console platforms, Xbox, PlayStation, Switch, but you have to get the authorization to get from the console providers to get their libraries and it's delivered under an NDA from them. But understand the capability is there. So if we take a look next at some of the benefits on the implementation of this, for one, complete freedom of licensing fees. You get to actually spend your money where it needs to be. You get faster innovation because it's open, openly governed and collaborative. So you have a lot of different groups that are working on a lot of different pieces that are brought up in a governed manner. And then these implementations, you know, it's not like somebody's thinking, hey, I think the world wants this. You have actual needs and wants that the, that the community is promoting through RFPs. And as a result, you get that support and talent that empowers this project growth, research and development. And of course, having all the documentation ready to go that's getting updated for support is crucial. And then, of course, the Linux Foundation, which has about 20 years of expertise in open sources in general. So I want to talk a little bit about that with the Linux Foundation. If you're not familiar, uh, the goal is to create the greatest shared technology investment in history by enabling open, open collaboration across companies, developers, and users. So the idea here is that the Linux Foundation is there to build ecosystems from uh, all the different companies and initiatives that are all around, bringing them to a level playing field so that it can be adopted on a global scale. So, and it's more than just Linux. You might recognize a couple of these logos, things like you know Jenkins and uh, GraphQL and uh, you know Node, Risk. So the thing is, it's the largest open collaboration nonprofit. It has 1,700 members across 40 countries. 100% of them are Fortune 100 tech and telecom. And we have over 40,000 developers that are contributing on each of these different projects. So there's quite a bit happening here, and there are over 300 projects that are underneath of it. So we've gotten pretty good at it. 
So what is the thing that the Linux Foundation actually puts into this? Well, they have the governance and membership where they actually help make sure the policies are together, that the business development and membership recruitment and the management of it stays on top. If you don't have people, you don't have a project. Also making sure that the technical decision making, getting the technical steering committee put up, making sure that the life cycle is operable, make sure that we have release process and mechanisms that are in place, and also making sure that you have the continuous integration, uh, development infrastructure so that you can use the best practices so people can actually get to the, uh, to the software. And at the same time, you have the different release en engineering, DevOps, security, and also it's just as important to have that ecosystem development, which is the evangelism and the outreach projects, bringing developers to conferences, bringing them together and helping train different developers and administrators and kind of put together that professional certification program so people know when they want to hire or use someone that they're credentialed, they know what they're getting. And then of course the IP management, nobody wants to try and build a project on something that has patents or potholes or things are gonna get them sued when they go to commercialize the product. So that's one of the big things that the IP management, making sure that it stays clean so people can use that even when there are groups contributing in. So open source, you can't just throw it over the wall. This is one of the first things that we kind of ran into when we started down this road. And that's because sustainable ecosystems matter. Now, when I talk about a sustainable ecosystem in open source, um, it's not like kind of like Gen 1 and Gen 2. In the current generation of uh, open source projects, you'll find out that you have a lot more companies that are involved with groups. And so the way that we've looked at this is from a flywheel mechanism. You have a technical community that are working with companies and that community has felt needs. I need this product. I need this feature. I want to see this. I want to do that, which are great because it's driven by that. And so they work together with both engineers from companies and the community to start building these technologies. Well, as a result, it winds up creating products. And these products then actually create markets that companies can get into and they can start generating revenues, which allows them to be able to participate back into the open source project. So this flywheel allows it to continuously grow where it goes back into the technical community and we repeat the cycle of innovation. So to a company perspective, they look at it where projects create products, which create profits. And there is a balance here of this flywheel between community and commercial. We're creating that alignment is actually essential for rapid growth because they have, when they have that ecosystem, they can support the openly uh, developed technology into those products and solutions, which then when they're able to turn it into profit, they contribute back. And so this is a sustainable ecosystem where it's not just driven on who's gonna show up, but also who is aligned to make sure that it's successful. So who would be your partners? When we took a look at the partners, we wanted to say, well, you have to make sure you have a motivated community and the right partners for growth. So some of the ones you might recognize here, like Adobe, Intel, these are different companies that have interests that believe that an that open 3D engine would be fantastic and would be able to have the right opportunities from to grow with. And so we wound up talking with each one of these, walking through what does the case look like? And you'll find out you've got everything from large companies, smaller game developers, support companies. You have um, you know open source projects as well. You have support groups for the independent game developers and education that are involved. So you have to complete the ecosystem. It's not just how do you go drum up the biggest company. You actually have to be able to address each one of those different areas to complete your right ecosystem to motivate the community. And the thing is the community needs growth. And it's key. If you don't have community, you just don't have it. And people need to be invested in the project. You have to be able to encourage open discussions. If they aren't talking, they don't feel invested, they're not sure what they're getting involved with. And not everyone is a coder. People think, well, when I get involved in an open source project, I need to be able to program. It's not the case. Some of the most brilliant ideas come from people who are not coders. Becoming a coder is the result of something, but you still need people who like process and flow and art and documentation. And these are all just as critical because without them, the project can fail. And you have to provide ways to mature those creative ideas. You don't wanna just shut someone down. You wanna open up a process where people can actively contribute from their disciplines. And then having events, meetups, and jams, these help strengthen those bonds and relationships, which then strengthens the community. The expectations are essential. You cannot overstate what the capabilities are. If you walk out there and say, oh, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread and the world finds it, that's not to be, you're gonna have a dead project with a lot of frustrated people. So don't ever overstate. Give a roadmap. Show people where they can find the work in progress of what's going on. And then also highlight the maturity of a feature or a platform. If there are things that are new that are great, highlight it, talk about it. People may find some things that could be make it better. Um, or really they could say, hey, I incorporated in this way and you've got yourself a great use case. 
don't ever compare yourself to others. It's just bad practice. The reality is that you are building something that is unique to your community. You don't have to compare yourself. And, and the funny thing is in open source, a lot of other projects that maybe you may compare yourself to, they may be more beneficial for them to use some of your technology and you to use some of theirs. So why create an adverse scenario when you don't need to? So comparing yourself doesn't really help anybody, especially in open source. And clearly communicate what works now and what will work later. So in other words, you have to tell people, here's what you can use, here's what's gonna be buggy or cause problems so they can understand what will they build with this. Transparency is required. Don't go into a dark hole and try to plan. You need the different perspectives to provide the greater capabilities. If you take this whole thing and you kind of go, hey, let's go talk in a dark room, you've missed out on half the community that can contribute. Meetings are done always in the open. So in other words, there's nobody that can kind of have this background agenda. It's always in the open, everyone can talk about it. We do RFPs, request for proposal, and what it does is you take an idea, you put it up, we have a template, and then everybody contributes to it and it matures into a feature that's well thought out. You don't have to be the only person thinking of something and the more people it gets behind it, the better it will become. And having a consistently public schedule that allows SIGs to grow, this is a big piece too, is that you want people that if they know they're involved with a special interest group and they wanna be involved in that discipline, they can show up at a scheduled time and always be able to put into it what they want for their interests. And when I asked a question in private, ask to move it to public. Just try to keep it from doing side DMs and things like that. Put it out in the open, you'll find out that a lot more people are just as interested as the question is, and try not to be embarrassed. This is how we grow and how we mature as a community and a project. They get, open source communities can get really upset when they aren't given the opportunity to contribute. When you're talking in a dark space and you're not transparent, they don't get to contribute. Now you're fighting an uphill battle of, why didn't you even bring this up? Why is this a sudden bomb? So everyone has a voice to be heard. That means that your agendas, when you have an agenda for a meeting, propose it and allow people to add topics. We do this in GitHub all the time where we have a proposed agenda, everybody adds to the thread, and then we actually take those proposals, put them in the agenda, and that becomes the meeting. So everybody actually has a piece, uh, you know, a piece of skin in the game. Uh, everybody has an equal vote to steer the project. So when we vote on who the, who the SIG members are, we, or excuse me, we vote on who the SIG leads will be and the steering committees, uh, everybody has an equal vote to actually control where this goes. And anyone can take an idea and champion to the community. You don't have to be the top-notch person. You can be any part of the ecosystem and still take an idea and champion it and talk to people. That's the key. It's all communication. And at the end of the day, the talents and ideas speak the loudest. It's great that you've done all these amazing things in the past, but what can we do now? What is it that you contribute? You'll find out that people will get behind you and your projects much faster by doing this. And encourage issue and encourage kind of raising issues that need to be discussed. Change is only effective, really, if you're using your voice. And the other part is that you've got to have frictionless discovery and contribution. People have to be able to communicate. We use Discord as our central hub. That means that you'll see hundreds, almost thousands of messages flying through per day in each one of the special interest areas. Be providing special interest groups will help you focus the feature disciplines. And the social media sites like Reddit and things like that, you want to highlight these achievements. The automation of social media is where we have, if something gets posted on all these different social media sites, they actually go back and they kind of post back into Discord. So we don't have any islands of information. If you post something in Reddit, it shows up in Discord. Discord community comes out and talks in Reddit. So you find they blend in. And then you have a clear process in docs so that people can onboard into the community quickly. These are essential. And then having simple tools like search capabilities so they can find historical references allows them to save a lot of time and frustration than asking the same questions over and over. And we have governance. The governance is what provides the structure. Uh, I'll give you a quick rundown on this. We have a governing board that makes the business and budget decisions. Um, premier members are companies that put in a uh, project and considerable money. They have a governing board seats each. Um, and then we have general members who are companies that put in smaller amounts but have a project. They get an elected governing board and that's for doing the business and budget decisions. Then we have a technical steering committee, which is completely separate. That is the strategy and conflict resolution. There are nine seats in there. Four of them are selected by the governing board, but five of them are done by the open source community, which means that at the end of the day, the open source community actually drives where the project goes from a technical perspective. And then we have the special interest groups, which actually go through the product features and selections, and then the maintainers and owners, which are done through an election process, usually a simple majority vote. Special interest groups, they're divided into these SIGs. They're really important because they're members from different disciplines with a common purpose of advancing that topic. So in other words, you don't wanna be talking about rendering inside of networking. It just becomes too much of a kludge. So your special interest groups help you segregate those. And there are a lot of disciplines involved in this project. 
And so it allows that focused distributed decision for each topic, like what should we be doing next in graphics? What should we be doing network next in networking? And then providing the focused resources and forums so that we don't have that cross, uh, you know, that, that cross noise of things that aren't related, but still having those pieces put together where they can collaborate when it crosses multiple sets of special interest groups so they can get work done and bring new contributors in. And then they, they have that kind of code ownership where each sub part of it has their pieces of what they'll be releasing on schedule and what they're managing by the SIG. And that goes for how it rolls up to the technical steering committee. So if there are any conflicts, they can resolve them with an overall view. And the technical steering committee is made up of the people from the SIGs. <clears throat> Give an example, these are the SIGs that we have, development pipeline, content creation, core engines. You can see some of these things that we have laid out, people who are interested in those areas, they get involved in those areas. If they don't have much knowledge in there, they may not go in there. And so things like platform, graphics and audio, the release SIG, security, testing, UI, UX, um, we have all these different areas so people can actually, actually do what they want in those areas where they enjoy the best. So let's talk about this kind of solution here. <clears throat> there are major components. We have an editor, which is all the component entities, the effects, the terrain vegetation, and that actually can provide that renderer, which is a brand new renderer, and I'll talk about that. I'm gonna dive into the technology after this, but where they can do realistic 2D and 3D in a scene. They have a deferred uh, rendering and lighting system. We actually have partners that are doing some of the particle effects, um, like popcorn effects. We have a shader material system that we have as part of this as well. And then you also have the animation system. So it has a complete motion FX animation system in it, the cinematics, the networking clouds. So you have a full networking stack. Um, that's kind of like a reminiscent of the Quake Tick model. Um, and I'll dive into that as well. And some of the cloud services support. And then you have the platform support, which means Mac, Windows, Linux, with authoring and runtime support. So I'm not just talking about how do I make a Linux build that just plays games. I mean, I can go and edit it and build my game in Linux and never have to touch a Windows machine or the same thing in Mac. The other part is that it will also compile out to Android and iOS. You have VR and, limited VR and AR support, which is still being matured, and of course the console support. So you can build your project in one place and be able to have it expand out into multiple areas. So let's get a little dirty here, um, get under the hood, and let's talk about what, we're, what we've got here on this. And Mind you, this is the developer preview. We decided to release it earlier than later when everything was perfected, because as I said, it, technical advancements, they keep moving forward very quickly. So there are a lot of things that work and a lot of things that are broken. And that's part of why we get people involved in the community because the velocity of what's going on in this has been absolutely ridiculous with the number, in, uh, with the number of people that have been contributing code and building on this. So the first thing we did was uh, we decided it was a change in approach and really making it unencumbered. So it's no longer monolithic. You'll find out that when you start using a game engine, uh, the first piece is if you're on you know, Unity or Unreal or Godot, you are using that engine. Um, you're not gonna take a piece of Unity and shove it into Unreal or vice versa. You're on that engine. So we broke that model instead and said that you don't have to adopt the whole engine. We separated all the components and made them completely modular. So that means that everything in here, the rendering system, the networking system, all of the different pieces here, these are all actually libraries that get loaded from a bootstrap, which means you can detach and separate them and use them in another project if you wanted to. So you can adopt what you want with your current stack. Let's just say somebody has a game already and they want to use the new network stack. They could rip the network stack out of this as a module and reduce their tech debt. You can take the renderer in here and you can literally disable it and it will still operate. Um, so as a matter of fact, there's a couple of groups right now that are building uh, true ray tracing software renderers on top of this. And the other part is having that kind of cross industry innovation support, which means having film and ash animation where we're driving the ACES color, uh, ACES color space compliance, uh, FBX also supporting USD and HDR 10 standards so that when somebody starts building on this, you actually have HDR native in any color space that you want to use. That also means that looking at how games, training, and simulations are driving the ARM VR with PC and mobile devices, and having that native ARM X, uh, ARM ARM64 X64 support for all the PC platforms as well as mobile devices and consoles uh, as needed. So ne the data-driven next re next generation rendering. So this is actually a live shot uh, that came out of the engine on what we're doing, and we'll be able to post this later on, so you can zoom in and check out all the fun stuff happening here uh, with this. So we have Atom, which is our new renderer from the ground up. It's a PBR uh, data-driven renderer. And so it supports Vulkan, Metal, DirectX 12 with ray tracing support. And we have HLSL compatibility, but we extended it for AZSL 
so that you can do kind of more exporting and control per rendering backend. And this is kind of important because it has a rendering pipeline interface that allows you to do creation of forward, uh, forward plus deferred, or hybrid through the PaaS system. That means that if there's a preferred rendering model that works better on mobile versus PC, you can use that but not have to rebuild your entire game. And that means you have no limitations. In other words, each one of the render, eyes, uh, the render passes uh, can be made to match the particular hardware restrictions. And you have the global illumination, which allows the forward or deferred on a per mesh, per material basis uh, with the different uh, filtering support. And there's no restrictions on the resolution size for reflection cube maps. We have support for parallax correction, mixed reflections per render pass, runtime editing, and the visualization for lighting artists. And it's fully multi-threaded. And it's a modular render, like I said, that you can pull apart, but that means we can also do future distributed rendering, su rendering support. So you could render out to multiple boxes, multiple nodes, or cloud instances. <clears throat> we went there with a quality, kind of a quality of life. Uh, we want the CMake build system, and that allows us to open up kind of C-test, gems code, and gems and code generation. So that means that you have your native IDE environment project generation, Visual Studio, Xcode, Ninja, Clion, Make, all of that you can find on GitHub on how to build it, or you can go into Discord and people will actually show you, here's how you can build them. And that also allows you to do kind of edit and continue and the profiling with the tool support. And the thing is that when you have this, you actually get a proper dependency tree so that when you need to build the target, you're only building the actual dependencies that you need to worry about instead of just building the whole entire thing. So the other part of this was the Lie SDK, which was so that you don't have to recompile everything. So you can actually use pre-compiled binaries and libraries and header support. The engine of the project can live in independent folders, and you can update the libraries that are used in the, uh, in the game engine folder versus the game project folder. So that means you can add or remove pre-compiled gems and not have to recompile the entire project on the changes. And if a new version comes out, you could take those new version binaries, plug them into your prior project, and as long as, there's any, as, long as you don't have any kind of uh, compile issues or incompatibility, you can use them and not have to recompile those whole areas. The good part about this is that if you decide to customize a particular module or a node um, and not create your own gem, you could continue to use upgrading of what the public binaries are and just throw yours in there as part of the pre-built components um, with your custom modules. So it kind of saves a lot of time when you're doing that. We took the physics approach on this, something a little bit different. Now, as the fault, we have physics that's in there. Uh, we don't need the old cry physics, but it's data-driven design uh, for independent simulation. So in other words, it's not just bolted for, cry, uh, for physics, it's actually an API system. And we did that intentionally because we knew that developers wouldn't just be using it for games. Some want to do you know, uh, water dynamics and airflow dynamics. And so we made it as an API so that people can actually plug in the physics systems that they want to use. And so as a result, you don't have to unwind code. That's been the critical thing, making sure you don't have to unwind code to put something in. And then we have the script canvas 2.0, which is the ability to actually writing code, uh, kind of the drag and drop connect code logic so that you don't have to write anything. Uh, so I'm familiar with like blueprints, it's the same kind of model that you can actually do all of it with uh, just drag, drop and connecting logic. But this will compile down to Lua and we have future native code support. Um, we have a behavior context that actually allows you to connect any language into the system and be able to extend it out. And then you have the reusable practice prototyping without having to rewrite everything for optimized output because it's actually able to compile down. So the networking stack, uh, this was a rewrite as well. So we have a highly flexible TCP UDP low latency transport that's behind a simple API, which means you have encryption and compression support, but we built in the simulator so that you can do your latency jitter reorder and loss um, you know, within the stack itself. We have where you can do entity replication using unordered, unreliable data replication for the lowest possible latency. Uh, and then you have player hosted and dedicated server. So you can do, uh, you know, peer to peer, or you can have dedicated server or scaling, but we have the local prediction latency compensation with the backward reconciliation so that you have the server authority to kind of keep some of the cheating at bay and you have detachable player behaviors. So in other words, you can uh, automate that desync and, and correction based upon what you want to have on the player behaviors of that are actively going on. And we have RPC and future elastic fault tolerant multi-server support. So in other words, what you build on top of this network stack, as we continue to mature it and we do multi-server support, you can then scale it to multiple nodes, have way more users per server instance um, or do it in a cluster and not have to rewrite your network stack with the same prediction and reconciliation. So the UI improvements, um, the whole entire engine is fully asynchronous loading. So in other words, it's all, it's, everything is streamed in without 
uh, any kind of blocking. Uh, it has support for it, but it's all asynchronous loading. So now you get to take advantage of how the fa underlying file system operates and how the system can actually run depending on what the hardware you're using. But that reduces the CPU memory and overall load times. We also have the Python UI tooling. So we found out the big thing here is that people want to be able to customize the different modules of how they use the editor. So the editor itself is all built in Qt. And so we have the Python extensions. And within the editor, you can actually write Python and create a whole new editor or whole new modules or do automation and create custom editor components right through Python. Uh, or you can write it in C++ if you want, um, which is the native engine. We also updated the math on it because a lot of times you'll find out the engines don't have the newest optimizations for the new processors. So we have an AXE SIMD library, which produces the best SIMD code, either for x64 SE, ARM, Nova, or it'll do pure scalar code if you need fallback compatibility. But this means that we also built that in as part of a transform library that has the position quaternion orientation and scale field so that you don't actually have to convert um, out of these type of uh, uh, out of these transforms and positions for an intermediary to go to graphics to come back, you can actually do the direct tran uh, transfer calculations uh, natively in the libraries. The other part is we have native prefab support. So that means you have reusable assets with complete properties, components, and hierarchies. Um, everything in this engine was changed. You'll find out that a lot of things uh, with it are commonly in engines. You'll find out they, used to, they like to use binary formats uh, for the authoring. Everything was changed to JSON, which means it's all human readable text formats. You can go through and write all your scripts and change everything you want in the background, um, just shifting it all with, with uh, JSON. And so the media tooling, we have an asset builder that when you bring assets in, they don't get compiled when you go to build it out. They're compiled on the fly as you bring them in, and then they're ready to go. The thing is, you can actually do them pre and post step. So if you have, let's say, an FBX with a lot of objects in it, where before it gets processed, you could say, break this out into 100 objects and rehome them to zero, rescale them to zero. And then I want you to build custom shaders based on these materials. You could do those in the Python bindings and modify them in flight processing if you have certain types or structures you want to do. That means that gives you that custom behavior for how you want to split, assign, and rehome. Uh, assets and control, we have greater, uh, faster processing. So again, the material creation, everything is done in JSON. So you can actually build everything you want for complete control. The asset processor re is reduced to seconds. It's able to recognize things that have already been processed and skip over them so that you can get into your project much faster. And we have a motion FX animation system that uses kind of a new shared format for meshing characters and that allowed us to make things run a lot faster for modern GPU and streaming when you're doing animation to kind of prevent some of that hitching. So the project management, all the complex tools, all these weird, funky binary tools, um, they've all been removed. And basically, it comes down to a simple JSON config. Projects and gems. If you want to add gems or modules into a project, it's done with CMake and JSON. Uh, you can literally update a gem. You can go into the uh, projects uh, JSON and edit a line and include a gem, and it's there. You don't have to go through a long, drawn-out process. But at the same time, your libraries and enable components are done where they're self-described. So what happens is when the components are put together, it is actually able to do the reflection on it on load up, and that allows it to understand what things, uh, what functions and calls are available within that particular library and how it can be used. You can use simple Python scripts that actually do the automation of creation for gems and projects or the management of everything. So the core improvements that we did in here, a few things if you've done a lot of with engines. Um, the big thing here is we have all of the libraries are done with a standard interface. So we did that as a replacement for the single handle for eBuses. So that means that for each object that you build, it's able to reflect and expose the interface of that, that library to any other caller, which means now you can do direct function calls with autocomplete out of your, say, Visual Studio or your editor and call the functions directly instead of having to go through a bus. We also changed our event system using kind of C-sharp event design patterns. So you don't have to worry. So it kind of replaced our notification bus. But then we also have a scheduled event. So you'll find out a lot of times, instead of ticking constantly for every frame, you can go through with a scheduled event, set time, placing, and priority so that you don't have any starvation or you're not running your CPU out and you can increase the number of objects that you're working with. The console support supports network sync to CVARs. So it makes a mock of the actual raw type that's thread safe and that allows you to use it by other threads. And we replaced our logger so that you can actually do runtime toggling and taggable um, without having to recompile. So you can change uh, the, layer, the levels of logging without, while you're actually operating it. The quality improvements, we changed some of the collision and cull culling. Um, the old Octree that we had in there was much faster. 
Uh, but this time, you now we've moved over to spatial hash based, which allows us to do that kind of an adaptive octree to cluster spatially closed entities. The reason for this is because you can visit the cells of the entities rather than the individual entities, and that guarantees that unique set of entities per cell. So that means that not one of them exists in more than one cell. So I don't need to do any sort and deduplication as a result. So now you have the generic intersection testing, spheres, WW frustrums, and it's built on top of the SIMD layer, which allows us to use the caching and paging for top performance. The AutoGem programming pipeline on this thing here that we put together, it has a code generator, which allows you to do the expansion times on this uh, with no real custom binary requirements. So you don't have a binary executable you need to use, and this can build work with the CMake system or with Python scripts. So you can allow that kind of data files and templates with expansion rules in your CMake to operate this with regex wildcard matching uh, to support kind of indi individual bulk files, but it's all data driven. So in other words, you can use XML or JSON documents and use Jinja2 as your templating language. And then last but not least, we have a white box that allows you to do the fast creation of manipulation for rapid prototyping. It's all driven by Python, so you can create and extend and modify this as you wish. So we'll go real quick over to these industries. Some of the areas that we're looking at where people can get involved, we have from hardware, simulation, game publishers, dev studios, kind of oil and energy. And then also you've got real estate, automotive training, and self-driving companies. The events. We have O3D Con coming up. Uh, if you haven't seen it, go check it out. Uh, we have our first conference. This is really essential for how you build a community. Start building conferences. We'll have about 21 dev tracks for people to learn how to use the system. We're putting videos online and having live presenters. And then we actually have an entire schedule of different talks that are involved in game, uh, diversity and inclusion, and things of that nature uh, within our second day track. The last part here is cultivating, which is driving the adoption through every industry. We, that's putting that training and education through leadership, building white papers and sharing success stories between companies and, 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 and consumers, building the interactive landscape so that people understand who's using it. Why should I care about this? Uh, the different training courses to evangelize and promote the best practices, creating a uh, developer certification, and then launch some of our dev stats. And then, of course, a meetup pro, uh, program to do all of this. The other part of this is to make sure that we're focusing on diversity and inclusion within our communities to make sure we have a safe place for people to be actually use all their brain power. I think there's a, quite a bit of that's untapped and we need to change that. So that means providing internships for underrepresented groups uh, to work on projects, summer of code, community bridge. So the other part is the diversity scholarships and accessibility for events, partnering with other organizations that are focused on these things like Women Who Code, Travis CI and ESA. And then also, working with different uh, different communities such as GDC, PAX, E3, and being at those conferences, working with them, as well as the collaborations with ASWF for film, energy, AI, and machine learning. That's everything. Uh, if you're interested in what we're up to, we have a Discord channel. When you get in there, it will probably overwhelm you because there is a tremendous amount going on. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Royal. That was an amazing keynote. Uh, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Nope. Uh. <laughs>
they decide they want to announce it. Okay, perfect, thanks. Um, one more question. I'm wondering what the evolution of this from close to open has been. What of these were hardships? I wonder what different projects they considered in those decisions to split out to JSON and the, and the Python plus Qt, et cetera. How are they working with their parent programs? What were the community versus project leadership decisions around all of the elements? That is, boy, let me tell you. Um, so there were a lot of decisions that went into this on how to arrive there. One of the first problems was really taking a look at what are the pain points people are dealing with when they actually try to build that. And the reason why JSON came around, it's most flexible um, and binary was just prohibitive. Uh, it, it became such a problem for so many areas because you had to write your own tools. I'm a big binary junkie. Um, I'm actually a developer by trade for over 30 years, so I don't mind writing code and I love binary. But for the rest of the world, eh, it's not really as much of it. Some of the decisions on how we did this in the community model was taking a look at what was successful and what was not successful. And then what applies to the games industry and what applies to different verticals and how do you actually grow that? So there was a lot of research that went into this to figure out what were the best practices. I've been involved with this from day one um, on all of it. So yeah, there was, there was a tremendous amount that had to go into how the decision were made. And to be honest, you never get them perfect. And that's why we have it and it's why we put it out at the time we did so that we can continue to hone and build this with the rest of the community. Um, there's something to be said about having, you know, thousands of people kind of kicking at you and uh, looking for where the holes are to help fix them. Right. Um, okay, one more question. What is the timeline for year 2022? 2022. Um, context isn't really there, so I'm going to take a wild guess on it. Uh, so in 2022, it is, for one, uh, we plan on getting a, a kind of a GA version of, that's not a developer preview by the end of the year. In 2022, it's having quarterly cycles of regular instances, uh, really working on building more game jams and development and uh, development studios to build on top of this, getting more partners that can bring some of the very, you know, the mature commercial tools uh, into this so people can build some pretty wild experiences. And also, you know, you've got to start taking a look at things that are going on like the metaverse and VR and AR and really building on top of those and helping people understand that this is a platform they can grow with and they can build with. And if they decide they want to take pieces of it and put it elsewhere, that works as well. But it's really about how the community can build and adopt something that we all want to use. Awesome. I think those are all the questions. Thank you once again for the amazing talk. Um, if you all love this talk, we have a lean coffee scheduled for later today at noon, which is a structured but agenda-less meetup um, where the audience decides the topic. And the theme for that lean coffee today is open source and gaming, interactive media, and entertainment. So hopefully to see you all there to talk more about this. And thank you so much once again, Royal. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, um, so the sessions are going to start in about four minutes. Uh, take a quick coffee break, and we will see you in tracks in four minutes. Thank you all, and have a great conference.